and uh, we are here to just uh, uh, give you a taste, if you like, through some of our champions that uh, today are going to <coughs> uh, provide a sort of introduction, a taste to the uh, many challenges that are implied in these uh, uh, new forms of production. I want only just to conclude to remember, to, to make a reference to the fact that uh, this is really a new frontier and this new frontier is expanding in a quite impressive way. And I want to uh, uh, make a reference uh, uh, today to a new initiative that uh, has been undertaken recently uh, <coughs> from the Ecuador uh, government, the government of Ecuador that uh, is developing in these same months uh, a project called Flock Society that adopted, it was the first government that, that in the world that adopted the common space peer production as a model to redesign public policies in uh, uh, a very uh, um, extended range of fields uh, of uh, regulation of the development of the society and in particular in the field of the uh, knowledge uh, and I want to remember this, uh, this project because also, also because we have friends that are involved in that project and also because that is a, a sign of the importance of this new model and um, uh, a precedent that uh, uh, should be looked at as a, an interesting and, and, uh, and uh, stimulating uh, <laughs> example to be followed by other governments and by uh, other uh, experiments in, in redesigning uh, public policies. So, uh, to conclude, uh, we are no now having uh, four uh, different speeches which are going to address different layers, if you like, of <coughs> this uh, uh, project and more in general of this uh, world of the common space peer production. Um, each of the speakers uh, uh, is going to introduce him or herself uh, uh, before intervening. The speeches are going to be quite short, uh, between seven, ten minutes maximum. And uh, after the speech, we are going to have a discussion, a debate uh, with uh, questions and, uh, and comments and reactions from, from the speakers. We also asked uh, to begin with a group of uh, uh, discussants, let's say, experts that uh, either are part of the project or are pract practitioners or, s or uh, scholars here in Barcelona of the field, but it's open to everybody and we hope to have a lively and, uh, and uh, stimulating uh, debate. So we are going to have now, uh, as first, uh, uh, Mario Fuster from IGOP, IGOPnet, that is going uh, to make uh, her intervention on what governance means in the digital environment and how it shapes collaborative production. Mm -hmm. Ah, see, sí, sorry. Uh, last uh, information is that after the meeting that is going to close at nine, uh, we are going to have a meet-up uh, or a, a moment of uh, socialization, of networking and of uh, uh, recreation, uh, etc. Also, it's going to be presented a first uh, version, sort of uh, in the logic of the free software, a first version of a directory that we are building uh, along with the project of the of commons based uh, uh, peer production cases. And so we are all, you are all invited to participate and to profit, and so we have a more informal uh, occasion to continue our conversation. I, and it's in the bar of the CCCB. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, being here. Uh, so uh, I am Mayo Fuster of, uh, from uh, Ecovnet, which is one of the, of the partners uh, of the project. Uh, my presentation is going to be first uh, the more basic one in the sense of giving an introduction of uh, common based peer production and then I will uh, address the question of uh, the governance of uh, common based peer production. So, but it, like in, very, in a very basic kind of uh, uh, introduction to common based peer production, 
what we see is that uh, it has a, in the in the com in the late years there is a, an increasing uh, uh, number of experiences that cannot be uh, situated in the binarium between uh, state and the market. So normally when we think about the models, the big models that we have for uh, resource production and resource provision, uh, generally we have the model of uh, through a market provision that there are companies who organize it or there is the model of the state that is more uh, hierarchically oriented. This kind of uh, binarium has been uh, present in the uh, mastery think thinking and uh, more and more time there are uh, experiences that are emerging that are questioning, questioning it. Uh, uh, one of these experiences are the natural commons that uh, were investigated by uh, Eleanor Ostrom who won the Nobel Prize of Economics in 2009 as a recognition of the importance of these forms of commons uh, organization of uh, natural resources that were more efficient than uh, if they would have been uh, uh, organized through market or state. And uh, uh, also lately, through the development of the new technologies, there have emerged other, other type of commons, like the digital commons that are more digitally oriented. Uh, so in, in a very kind of uh, basic approach, what we understand by uh, common based peer production, it refers to a third uh, form of, of uh, production that is uh, characterized by uh, a, a network of individuals that communicate and interact for the building and sharing of a common resource. Frequently, uh, not always, but frequently this uh, common resource is accessible as a public good or in a open access condition. Uh, the interaction uh, uh, is among peers in the sense that it's not based on uh, mercantile exchange, contractual relationship, or traditional hierarchical command. So this is like the in one shot kind of description of uh, what common based peer production is. Through the project, uh, one of the, the the, the tensions or the, the kind of dilemmas that we are uh, de dealing with refers to the relationship with common based peer production and the digital environment. In the sense of, uh, in, in our approach, the digital common based peer production is, is not uh, restricted only to the digital environment in the sense of that there is the, the, they existed uh, previously to the uh, digital uh, development. They existed cases of common based peer production or commons or social innovation before the development of the internet and they also uh, uh, they also uh, uh, exist beyond uh, this uh, this dimension however in the in the peer to peer value project because the project is oriented to to not only to understand the conditions that favor common based peer production but also to inform the design of a platform, a technological platform that uh, Samuel is going to present lately that uh, support these, uh, these uh, formats. Uh, we are going to privilege, privilege the cases that have some relationship uh, with the digital environment. The second element is that uh, when, we is, when we think about the relationship between common based food production and the digital environment, there are different type of, of of relationships and we distinguish between the cases in which the digital environment is the main uh, uh, sphere of interaction, uh, like, uh, like in the case of Wikipedia in which the Wikipedians uh, mainly interact through a platform over the internet, even if they meet uh, physically and in meetups or in an annual meeting, but the main interaction is through a digital platform and, uh, and there are other cases in which the main interaction is not in a digital platform, bar, but the resulting resource is hosted or transmitted through a digital platform. So for us, even if in our conception, common based peer production is not restricted to the digital environment, there are cases which are not were precedent to this and, and are not uh, strongly digital. If we can think about anything now that is not related to the internet at, at some point, but even still, we are going to privilege these kinds of cases that are, or uh, the interaction being in a digital platform or the final resource to be hosted in a digital platform because of the type of, uh, of goal of the project of informing a, a platform design. Uh, 
So this is the, the first uh, kind of uh, dilemma that we have been dealing with uh, through the project. So if we think about, as I was saying, there are different uh, previous, mo previous cases of uh, common-based field production, the natural commons, but if we think about the, the common-based field production that is digitally oriented, uh, and we uh, try to go into rebuild its trajectory, historical trajectory, what we find is that uh, already in the, in the, in the 50s, uh, uh, like the cultural, the, we can identify the cultural roots or the pioneers of these experiences in the hacking culture, the, the aiming of, of uh, playing through technology, the love of uh, sharing knowledge, and also the hippies. The, the hippies contra culture also play a very important role in the development of, of, of these uh, uh, the, the pioneers uh, uh, online communities. Then it appeared the first and most uh, most known and most classic model or, or case, which is the free software cases that uh, were very successful in the sense of uh, they become in some areas of the internet free software is much more predominant than the proprietary software. So commons become um, a, an option that is more efficient and is more able to, to inject creativity and have more impact than proprietary uh, uh, models. One of the cases is Linux. From 2001, we see then the expansion of the free software and open source projects of this collaborative form of production into other areas of free culture, uh, like uh, with the very also famous case of uh, Wikipedia. And from 2006, we identified that there has been an expansion of, of cases which are, have some commonalities with the common based field production, but they are different particularly if we analyze their governance format. And we call them corporate-based uh, peer production, which are, uh, uh, well, when I say we, it's, it's mainly me or in, in <laughs> EgoMed, but it's not everybody, <laughs> because we actually, in the project, we are, like we have also different, it's very interesting, because uh, in, this, in the frame of this project, I have found peop, uh, more, uh, people who has who came from other trajectories of common based production, other literature, other references. Uh, uh, for example, for me, the work of Jochai Benkler, the Wealth of Network, is a key reference. But people in the project has other other uh, references, and I think it's very very interesting to combine how um, trajectories that Adam can um, can uh, introduce, uh, which came more from a, a more uh, uh, market kind of formats uh, converse with the, the trajectories that we came in. And so, uh, as I was saying, after uh, 2006, there were an expansion of this type of cases, and now we are in a current situation in which we have, and the project is trying to face two types of challenges. The first challenge refers to the expansion of common-based peer production to other areas. So now there is common-based peer production applied to also uh, the production of physical resources, uh, and uh, the production of uh, uh, collaborative mapping uh, or collaborative consumption. There are mean, many kind of areas in which there is uh, expanding. So what we are doing is trying to uh, map this expansion into different areas, and we are doing this through uh, the directory of common based peer production that we will be will be presented later on. Uh, the second challenge refers that in this expansion of common based peer production, there is also an hybridization of, of it. So there are emerging models uh, and cases that cannot be, it's very difficult to, to, to identify if they could be conceived as common-based peer production or not. Particularly, there is an hybridization be between uh, market formats. So in the project, we are trying to address these two challenges, like um, mapping the expansion through other areas and also mapping its hybridization or its uh, uh, evolving uh, formats. And in, in, the, in this second element, in this second challenge, in what we have, the first exercise that we have done, it has been to establish some criteria of, of uh, delimitation or typification of common-based peer production. And um, these criteria are mainly uh, four. One, the first element, like these are the elements that for us help us to define, to, to establish if, com if, if experience is common-based peer production or not or to help us uh, see which type of common-based peer production. The first element is that it has to be collaborative production in the sense of it has to be involved collaboration. 
So it has to be an intended action. It has to be also a production in the sense of there has to be some, some resource that were not there previously, but this resource can be any kind of thing. Uh, and we have mapped also different type of co collaborative formats. The second uh, criteria is that it has to be between peers in the sense of there have not to be a contractual relationship that the people is not contributing because having a contract with the community, even if they have a contract with an, a company, but the relationship inside of the community has to be not contractual and have to not base it in hierarchical uh, command. And, uh, and um, it's, as you see, we define peers in terms of negative, uh, in a negative way. We say there, is not ne there, there are not contracts. There are not mercantile exchange. There are not traditional hierarchical commands. But this is because we don't know them enough. In the sense of we, there are hierarchies, just that they work differently than the traditional ones. There are forms of exchange. It's not through, mark, through money, but it, it's, it could be through, through exchange of reputation or exchange of social uh, currencies. So there are exchange, there are hierarchies, there are power concentration in these formats, just to, that they work differently than in the, in the market and in the state, and we need to understand it in order to, to characterize it. The third criteria is that they have to be common based in the sense of it's not enough that it's peer-to-peer -peer production. It has to be also commons. And the uh, commons refer to, to that is driving mainly from a, a, an approach of uh, uh, wanting to um, contribute to the general collective interest and to privilege the accessibility from the resulting resource more by more than its restricted uh, access or its pro, uh, pro, pro appropriation by a, a set of members. This, this element of being in a commons in the digital environment many, in many occasions is being uh, done through uh, uh, being open access, even if uh, uh, it's very difficult because some of the cases also enter into a market exchange of with the uh, final resource. So here, the, the relationship between markets and, and the final commons is something we also are going to be exploring. exploring. The next and uh, final uh, criteria of the limitation refer that peers have to be in an autonomous condition and uh, which favor aut autonomy of the peers and it favors also commun commonness. The, the element that it has to be replicable or the possibility to replicate and, the, and um, create derivative work of the process and the outcome. This um, um, refer, uh, again, in the cases that are not digital, it's more difficult to identify. In the cases that are digital, this refers as the condition of workability, in the sense of there has to be technically and legally the ability to uh, create derivative work from uh, the final resource. Uh, just to conclude, we, we just explain you that in the, during the project, we are going to be analyzing how different factors of productivity or how different elements contribute to value creation in common based peer production. And we are going to be looking to uh, elements like, we are going to be identifying like uh, elements or around the governance, the sustainability uh, uh, strategy of the cases, the legal design, the technical strategy, the resource characteristic and the community attributes. And we are going to be analyzing like these factors of productivity and trying to understand how they explain the, capaci the capability of, of the cases to generate value. There are some cases that are able to generate uh, participation, to generate collaboration and, and to generate a very rich resource and there are others that, do that not. We, we are trying to identify which are actually the, the, the factors or the designs that favor more uh, value creation. But before we need to also define what value means, which is a very challenging question in the project itself, because value cannot be identified through monetary value, like is normally the case outside of common based production. And we are going to be doing this analysis through a method triangulation and a statistical analysis of 300 cases, then qualitative case studies, digital ethnographies, a survey to uh, participants and legal analysis. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got too long, so I'm not going to present the element of the governance, but uh, <laughs> this gives you a, an, an overview of the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Mayo took a little more time because she introduced the, the whole 
at least the whole uh, in terms of uh, social science uh, objectives. And uh, uh, as I did with Mayo, I will uh, remember to the speakers uh, their time. First, I will uh, make a sign when you pass the seven minutes, and then when you have to like end. Bigger sign. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Primavera De Filippi uh, from CNRS uh, France, and uh, she's going to intervene on the legal challenges around collaborative production. There is no. There is no uh, way of switching. So okay, it works. Okay. Um, so I'm Primavera de Filippi. I'm a researcher at the CERSA, which is a research center of uh, the CNRS and uh, the University of Paris. And um, so the CERSA is the legal partner of this um, project, and uh, the role is to actually identify and. Uh, <laughs> to identify and to analyze the um, legal issues surrounding the collaborative production on internet and uh, with a view to uh, come up with a series of recommendations and best practices in order to um, resolve the challenges. So, okay. Uh, so today I'm going to provide a general overview of uh, those legal challenges around collaborative production and I will focus in particular on uh, the um, regulation of the content that is being produced and the regulation of the platform on which this production is taking place. So uh, to begin with the content, the main problem is uh, essentially related to the fact that uh, copyright law was designed long time ago and uh, today is uh, to some extent unable to cope with uh, the new practice that are emerging on the internet and with the advent of digital technologies. So when one look at uh, the uh, concept of the author, copyright law was essentially designed around the concept of one individual person that uh, operates on its own and um, was uh, contribution over the prior art was clearly identifiable. Uh, the law also creates a clear distinction between the right of the producer which creates the content and the rights of the user that merely consume this content. Now the problem is that on the internet and in particular in the context of uh, collaborative production we are no longer dealing with just one author, but uh, we are dealing with multiple contributors that uh, cooperate together towards the creation of one single collaborative or um, collective work. And uh, the contribution of those different users are difficult to distinguish between each other. So the um, distinction between the user and the producer becomes also more difficult to um, to clearly delineate as uh, users are increasingly uh, contributing to producing the works and to improving the works that they are consuming uh, in manners that are often uh, anonymous or to the least uh, pseudonymous. And um, then when we look at uh, the content that is actually being created, uh, we are progressively moving away from uh, the um, concept of a work that was static and that was fixated into one particular media. And we are moving towards a more dynamic conception of uh, a work that is interactive and uh, that is constantly evolving over time as it receives the feedback of the public. So uh, more and more we have authors that are no, no longer providing a finished work but rather uh, provide a platform and invite the public to cooperate and to collaborate in order to improve and to produce new works which themselves can be granted a copyright right uh, over the content. So uh, taking this into account then um, we can see that the default provision of copyright law actually make it difficult to achieve a proper um, collaborative peer production on the internet because it will require essentially to keep track of every single contributor 
and uh, to obtain a license over, uh, over every use or every modification that one wants to make over the collaborative work. So the solution is either we have to automatically assign the copyright in every contribution to one centralized entity that will then become responsible of uh, governing and regulating the exploitation of this work, or it is possible to take a more decentralized approach and uh, establish alternative intellectual property regime by contractual means, as it was done initially with the free software and the open source licenses, and then um, with the Creative Commons licenses in order to allow anyone to freely use and reuse creative works according to specific condition which has been uh, established in advance through the licenses. And then uh, beyond the content, there are also uh, many legal issues surrounding the regulation of uh, online peer production community themselves. Um, if one looks at uh, the legal framework in which those community operate, we can see that uh, there are, uh, at least at the European level, many laws that uh, regulate the um, production and the consumption of intellectual property, the enforcement of copyright. Uh, there are also um, requirements to preserve the confidentiality of communication and the privacy of end users, as well as uh, various requirements concerning the security and the responsibility of online service providers. So the question is, to what extent does law uh, actually relate to online peer production communities? So first of all, there is the problem of the jurisdiction and the question of uh, what is the applicable law, which is a question often very difficult to determine because those communities generally operate on a global scale and they are essentially transnational. And then there is the important question of the regime of intermediary liability limitations, which could potentially apply to online peer production community uh, insofar as they actually abide to the monetary obligation and that they implement the notice and take down procedures. The problem is that uh, uh, those rules only apply to the extent that there is in fact a central entity that uh, is um, regulating the production of those companies uh, or those community as some kind of um, editor or publisher. And this is uh, unfortunately not always the case. So uh, in order to understand the extent to which those law can actually affect the production of uh, online peer production community, then we need to look at uh, the underlying infrastructure and the technical features that are implemented into the online platforms on which they operate. So basically every online architecture according to its degree of decentralized can be situated on a continuum that range from the most centralized model based on the traditional client server uh, architecture to the most decentralized system based on distributed peer-to-peer -peer networks. And so the advantage of the centralized approach is that it is much easier to regulate the operation of the, um, of the community because they can rely on a centralized entity that essentially dictates the rules to which everyone has to abide. The problem is, of course, that everyone becomes highly dependent on this centralized structure. And so, uh, conversely, in the case of decentralized architecture, everyone is actually contributing with their own resources to the overall operation of the network. And so, everyone is, to some extent, much more autonomous. Even though, of course, the problem is that the higher is the degree of decentralization, then the harder it is to control and to regulate the operation of the network as a whole. <coughs> So, as a general rule, um, we can say that uh, decentralized architectures are more likely to be compliant and respectful of the individual rights of users uh, in terms of privacy and freedom of, of expression. Yeah. And um, so in terms of privacy, the data is uh, located generally on the user device, so it becomes more difficult for a third party to control or, or to monitor the communication. And this can be made even more difficult by relying on specific technologies such as uh, encryption or uh, privacy enhancing technologies. In terms of freedom of expression, similarly, uh, because there are no single information gatekeepers that can preclude access or that can censor certain communication, then user can communicate more freely. 
uh, in particular when the platform actually allows for anonymity so that people can express themselves without having to be afraid of any kind of retaliation. Now the problem is that uh, technology is essentially neutral and so it can be used for good things but also for bad things. And so to the extent that they promote uh, anonymity and freedom of expression, those platforms could potentially be used also by malicious users in order to perform criminal activities. So for instance, copyright infringement, as we have seen with uh, the deployment of several peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, but also in order to perform more, cri more criminal activities, such as, um, for instance, um, as it has been seen in the case of Silk Road, where uh, people were relying on the anonymity provided by Tor and Bitcoin in order to reduce the likelihood of being identified and incriminated in order to sell uh, drugs or weapons on the internet. So essentially, um, as the legal team, our objective is to analyze uh, a large number of existing peer production platform and uh, identify what are the um, regime of intellectual property that they have adopted and what are the technical features that they have implemented in order to try and understand what are the implications of those choices over the overall productivity and the long-term sustainability of those platforms. And so to conclude, the overall goal of, um, of the SARSA is uh, to come up with uh, the most appropriate combination of legal tools and technical features in order to try and create a platform that will be secure and privacy compliant and that will promote and support collaborative production while encouraging the best practice in the context of online peer production community and trying to dissuade or discourage the deviant behaviors. We finish. Thank you very much, also for uh, staying uh, strictly <laughs> in, in the time. So the next uh, speaker is Adam Arvison, uh, who is from uh, Milan, the University of Milan. I also would like to remember uh, his last book, that is The Ethical Economy, Rebuilding Value After the Crisis, which is a very interesting and stimulating uh, book he, he co-authored. And uh, Adam is going to talk exactly about this <laughs> very challenging uh, aspect of our research, which is value in collaborative economies. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Um, Mayo, could you open up the browser? Because if you open up the browser, there's a shameless advertisement for the book. <laughs> no, the uh, Internet X, the uh, Firefox. There we go. Okay. That's the one, I think, yeah. So I'm shamelessly advertising the book because I couldn't load the Prezi presentation that was going to illustrate it, but I'll just talk anyway. So, um, yeah, um, the first thing I wanted to say is that collaborative production is already undermining capitalism. Uh, it's happening as we speak. Right? That's a grand statement, but there's actually uh, a lot of data to back it up. Um, one of the most curious things that have um, figured within the capitalist economy in the last 30 years are so-called intangible resources. I don't know if you heard about this term, but if you look at the market value of the world's largest corporation, you can look at the Standard & Poor 500 index, for example, which is an index based on the 500 largest multinational corporations in the world. You'll find that their market value is um, based on so-called intangible resources um, to, a percent, to a share of 70%. It right? used to be 20% in the 1950s, and the percentage has increased um, continuously and acceleratingly since the 1980s to reach about 70% today. Um, and what are intangible resources? Well, intangible resources are generally defined as brand innovation or flexibility. There's a number of different definitions circulating within accounting and finance speak, but essentially these are these three things. Um, and why are they intangible? Well, they're not intangible because they're made out of air, because there are a lot of things made out of air like cleaning services or taxi rides, etc., that are perfectly 
uh, they do not count as intangible resources. Patents, for example, are not intangible resources, but implicit or tacit knowledge is an intangible resource. They're intangible resources because there's no way to value them. Right? That's the point. Intangible resources means resources that we suspect are valuable, that, but that we can't value with any kind of precision or rationality. Right? Um, and if you look at how these intangible resources are produced, it's quite safe to argue that intangible resources like brand flexibility and innovation uh, are essentially produced by what Mayo referred to as a third mode of production that is distinct from either markets or hierarchies. Right? In fact, accompanying the rise of intangible resources within accounting and finance from the half of the 1980s and onwards, there was a parallel increase in talk about a new and third mode of production within management studies at the same time. So beginning in the 1980s, management scholars begin to talk about things like communities of practice or collaborative community or corporate clans, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the common denominator for all these new terms is that they pretty well fit our definition of a collaborative, commons-based peer production. These are instances of people collaborating without any direct command or without direct monetary motivations. Of course, in corporations, people are paid, but they're not paid in relation to their efficiency as collaborators, unlike a worker on the assembly line who might be paid an hourly rate or even a piece rate. Um, and they collaborate in organizations that are hierarchical, but that are based on bottom-up hierarchies, hierarchies that the users themselves create. And they collaborate in ways that utilize common resources, such as principally the common knowledge that's being increasingly stored within corporate intranets, etc., from the 1980s and onwards. Um, so there is an antecedent of this commons-based peer production within the corporate economy, and it is an antecedent that is now well, uh, responsible for the major value crisis that is, that is presently uh, challenging the corporate economy and the manifested in the sense that 70% of that corporate economy cannot be valued, which of course means that 70% of that economy cannot be managed in any sort of rational way. Because if you can't measure the value of something, then you can't really manage it rationally or evaluate how much it's worth in relation to something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means, of course, that it's not only theoretical, but also politically very pertinent to understand how to value commons-based peer production. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's important to do that, not only because it's important to understand how non-corporate forms of co commons-based peer production, such as free software or uh, social innovation or the emerging commons-based hardware, uh, open hardware, open manufacturing economy works. But it's important to do that because it also, it also means that uh, it's important to understand how the sort of core object of the global information economy operates, which we don't really know today. So there are different theories that are around about commons-based peer production. And of course, those are the theories that we will try to work with and evaluate in this project. Um, one theory is, is the sort of the Jokli Benkler theory, uh, which is really a non-theory because what Jokli Benkler says is that there's actually no theory of commons-based peer production. There are a multitude of different motivations and we don't really need a theory of value because as long as we can connect enough people around the project, there will always be enough people who contribute regardless of what their motivations are. So. Uh, it, value is not really a problem uh, for, for Jokli Benkler. It's sort of an uh, anarchist theory of peer production in a sense. Um, second approach that's been building up over the last 10 years is a sort of an uh, ordo or orthodox Marxist theory where you go back to the labor theory of value and you say that people who use Facebook uh, contribute to realizing the value of Facebook and in that way they are exploited in the same way as workers are exploited in a factory in the sense that Facebook appropriate the surplus value that they create. Um, and um, uh, that's another theory that 
that's been going around for a while. It's, um, I think it's wrong because for a whole series of reasons that maybe we can go into in the discussion afterwards, but uh, one of the principal reasons is that Facebook really doesn't make that much money from its users. It makes money from financial investors. Uh, Facebook earns a uh, billion dollars according to its own invented accounting standard, so non-generally accepted accounting practice. 2012, Facebook claimed to earn about a billion dollars from its users, which is about a dollar per user per year, which isn't that terribly much surplus value to extract. Um, according to generally accepted accounting practice, it earned 43 million instead, which is much less. But it got uh, about $99 billion in investment in its IPO round, so it's more of a financial bubble than a machine for exploiting value from users. But we can talk about that later, because the seven minutes have now passed. Um, so, and then there's a third theory, which is my theory, which you can read about in this book, uh, which is the right theory, I think, and I'm sure, that, <laughs> I'm sure that the data will prove us right once we get it. It's usually like that. When you're a non-empirical sociologist, you have a theory, and then the data proves you right in the end. But, um, but that theory is that actually common, engaging in common space peer production is, is not so much like labor, it's more like work or action, if you remember those categories from Hannah Arendt, right? Hannah Arendt was, didn't like labor. She thought about labor as the toiling away that factory workers and slaves do, and it's mindless and oppressed. But free people engage in action or work. Work is what craftspeople do, and action is what sort of public figures do when they act. Um, and action and work, according to Hannah Arendt, is evaluated in terms of what other people say about it. So uh, enterprising actors and excellent workers, in Hannah Arendt's version, are ent considered enterprising and excellent because other people consider them enterprising and excellent. So essentially, it's the reputation that determines the value. And then you can argue that this reputation is based partly on technical skills, like being a good programmer, and partly on civic skills, like being good at keeping a particular production network together, resolving conflicts, socializing newbies, etc. That probably changes a lot from one network to another. Um, the point is that, if you think about it in this term, uh, you can see also empirically that reputation is emerging as a common currency of value in a wide number of empirical instances of common space peer production. And if you posit it in terms of reputation, and I have one more minute, if you posit it in terms of reputation, uh, you can also reintegrate the theory of common space peer production within established notions of economic rationality because reputation is a cur currency that can be valorized in many different ways. If you have a good reputation, it contributes to the experience. Uh, you can use reputation as a currency in order to realize economic gain down the line. If you're a freelance designer, for example, your reputation determines how much money you make. Software programmer, your reputation determines how easy it is for you to get a job. Um, and you can use reputation in this context as a form of social capital. If you have a lot of reputation, it's easier to initiate a project to fork off, as Mayo, term Mayo used, etc. And finally, and this is the final thing I say, reputation also explains how intangible resources are valued on the macro level because these things are valued essentially on financial markets, but on financial markets there are absolutely no rational ways of estimating these values, but they are valued according to reputational estimates so that, for example, when Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars in 2012 right before the IPO, it wasn't because it needed Instagram, because it prob probably had created its own Instagram for much less money, but it was because buying Instagram for a billion dollars shows that it's an expansive and innovative company and it builds up its brand before the important event of the IPO so that the IPO could be set at the astronomical overvaluation of $100 billion. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, <coughs> also for being in time. And uh, so, <laughs> The last uh, speaker is going to address in some way a core objective of this project that until now has been kept a little bit in the shadow, apart from uh, Primavera, that is uh, the technical design. And uh, uh, the speaker 
uh, is uh, Samer Hassan and from the Compl uh, Università Complutense de Madrid. Uh, the speech is titled Decentralized Technologies to Support Digital Commons. Thanks a lot, Marco. Uh, well, we, well, I come from the Gracia team, uh, from the Complutense University of Madrid, as Marco said. And I'm going to speak about, okay, we have a fantastic web 2.0, we have YouTube, we have users producing a lot of content, they are empowered, there is community participation, uh, they communicate, there is a boost of online communities, user-generated contents, uh, in even initiatives of free culture and digital commons, but wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> This has meant a lot, um, forgetting a bit about the decentralized nature of internet, concentration of all these um, contents and production and interaction in the hands of a few large for-profit corporations that are basically centralizing the web services in what we now call the cloud, right? So, there are some issues with centralization. centralization. Um, there, is, there is a famous sentence saying that uh, if you are not paying for the service, maybe it's because you are the product. This means that they, have, they are for profit entities that actually are taking a benefit of this user generation by giving it for free, right? This is facilitating uh, surveillance as there is a single controller. Uh, we all know about Edward Snowden and other leaks and NSA that is very popular right now in the media. Backdoors, monitoring, data mining, profiling of these large entities that are controlling this data. There is a single point of failure, which means that there is a huge concentration of power, resources, and control in the hands of one single entity, which gives them a centralized control which uh, allows to, uh, the appearance of censorship, filtering, or policies that only they deci decide. For example, to make compulsory the real names in Google Plus or in YouTube, so it has uh, uh, more value for uh, advertisement. It's basically top-down, because the decision-making is controlled by the elite, controlling this uh, entity, and there is no community involvement in the decision making usually. It's basically generalizing very uh, United States centric because most of the most popular web services are based there, and then there is uh, the legal framework that applies, it's mainly that one, the laws of the US. Apart than the information I mean, each time that we use Google services, our information goes through the cables, uh, through the American territory, right? These entities in general use proprietary software, which means opacity and a policy, uh, I mean, a approach of take it or leave it. If you don't like it, don't use it, be because there is no way in which the community can influence in how this software runs. And it's a single ownership of the infrastructure. This means uh, the, of the, both the infrastructure and the contents, the results. So to catalog this as commons, it's a bit uh, fuzzy. So what can we do uh, to handle these issues, right? Okay, uh, the obvious answer, oh, we can do it uh, free, libre, open source software, which would provide transparency, accountability, it would be working in the open, it's more secure, flexible, reproducible, there's a community behind it. We guarantee that there are no backdoors, no dependencies. But this is not enough. Actually, uh, we could have many of the previous issues even if the single entity runs uh, free delivery software. So we should move forward decentralization, uh, which would imply as Previously, previously other, other, other people mentioned it. Pr uh, privacy embedded in the design of this uh, structure, because it's decentralized, it facilitates encryption, it facilitates anonymity, or uh, either in the approach of 
complete anonymity or multiple identities, ident identities or nickname based, so no one knows your real name. And it, does, it cannot impose a single policy because there is a decent, uh, because I mean, naturally there are uh, many nodes and many policies that can be applied. The, uh, the control is basically decentralized and this promotes autonomy, uh, autonomy and the social control. It's bottom up, it's community driven and there is a shared ownership of the network. And uh, it promotes diversity. Uh, doesn't matter if we talk about culturally or legally. And we, we can have even uh, adapted nodes for different fields, for different um, local communities. So how can we decentralize? Well, uh, the classic approach that we all know is a centralized infrastructure, infrastructure. There is one node, like in Facebook, one community, and if I belong to, to Facebook, I belong to this walled garden that millions and millions of people belong to. We can have, uh, there, there are other approaches in which, okay, no, no, no. The Ning, for example, provides, you, you can create your own community and with uh, like your own closed community, but uh, and, and differentiating one community to, to, to the other, but there is a single owner of the infrastructure and a centralized infrastructure in any case, the, regardless if the servers are in the same place or not. We could have a federated infrastructure, which recently there is, uh, the, the state of the art is pushing forward this approach. And we have several, I mean, a Twitter that is decentralized, uh, such as Identica. We have social networks that are like Facebook that are decentralized. We have collaborative platforms that are decentralized, like Kuna. Uh, decentralized in, in which way? Well, there are many nodes that are interoperable with each other. So as in email, I could register in one node and I can still communicate or collaborate with any other user that is registered in any other node, right? There is also the extreme or uh, uh, decentralization, but it would be completely peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. That is, there is no uh, server up client approach, but we run the, the software in our own computer, and everyone dealing in the network with in, in the servers, it's, it's running it from the computer. But this, uh, recently there is a clone of Twitter called Twister that appeared basically weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, it's just a prototype, but it's trying to explore this uh, completely peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure which, in which each user runs a piece of the whole network. Within a uh, peer-to-peer -peer value project, we will uh, build a federated infrastructure, building on, on top of the existing Kuna project by the community non profit, in order to build a software platform that would boost sustainability, both macro and micro, in these commons-based peer production communities that uh, were explained before. We will try to follow a privacy by design approach, and uh, the social research of our colleagues <laughs> will uh, be able to be injected in the platform. And uh, we will deploy this fantastic and incredible platform that we will build into real world communities and test them there in order to have feedback and, uh, and hopefully build something that is, has Use, uh, social useful value for the, these communities. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so I think uh, that uh, a test was provided of the complexity of the project, of the uh, different uh, terrains uh, that uh, are, uh, we are facing as, as challenge and, uh, and how also I suppose uh, uh, stimulating is the project, but difficult at the same time. And, uh, and also you had a taste of the debate that is also internal to the group uh, because of this character of frontier of the research uh, 
under many aspects uh, is still a, a field that uh, is uh, is really a, a, a its embryonic developments and uh, but uh, really really important and, and stimulating uh, we think uh, as I said uh, now we open to general uh, participation uh, we asked uh, however some people to uh, begin this this uh, moment of uh, open debate um, I would say that interventions should stay between three five minutes and uh, I also suggest, I don't know what do you think, uh, but that we make, uh, we can uh, stop uh, at some time the interventions uh, from the floor and, and give the possibility of, uh, to the speakers to react. Uh, so let's see how it proceeds. I, uh, there, there should be a, mi a microphone in the, in the room. Is there? Yes. So I, I is there? <coughs> 